is Helen Yi, and I am a commissioner for the Columbus Community Relations. Today's session is Achieving Equity in Public Accommodations. It is brought to you by the City of Columbus Department of Neighborhoods and the Community Relations Commission. I would like to thank the Commission's Issues and Education Committee for planning the series, which focuses on the four areas of protection that exist against discrimination in Columbus. The Community Relations Commission supports all Columbus residents by accepting and investigating complaints of discrimination. If you feel you have been treated differently in the last six months, you may be able to file a complaint at www.columbus.gov slash discrimination. Ensuring the equal, equal protections of all residents of our city is a critical part of the work we perform. It is also foundational to Opportunity Rising, Mayor Andrew J. Ginther's aspirations for every Columbus resident to equitably prosper and grow. The commission will be participating in Rise Up CBUS events throughout the summer where you can learn more about programming that supports Opportunity Rising. I encourage you to come see us at an event in your area. The schedule is available at www.columbus.gov slash riseupcbus. I would now like to introduce our host for today's session, Denzel Porteous, Executive Director of Stonewall Columbus to provide welcoming remarks. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Is it afternoon? It is afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm so excited that you all are taking space in Stonewall today. This is a, a truly uh, wonderful opportunity. Um, again, my name is Denzel Porteous. I use he, they pronouns, and I have the pleasure of serving as executive director of Stonewall Columbus. Um, for those of us who are unaware of what Stonewall is, uh, for 40, almost 41 years, uh, we have served the community as its LGBTQ community center and organization. Um, the evolution of our organization uh, has, has uh, changed and evolved, and we are so pleased to, to be in this position where we are today, working as best as we can to uplift and support all of our LGBTQIA plus community members, and then to be a resource, uh, a, a, a fountain of information for others in the community who are looking to understand uh, the LGBTQ queer community here across Central Ohio. I, I think it's a, a wonderful opportunity to have this conversation about a public accommodations and have this conversation here uh, at Stonewall Center, uh, where our, we understand that our LGBTQ identities can still be um, uh, uh, unlawfully uh, evicted or kept out of homes and housing uh, for simply being who they are and expressing themselves as they want to. Um, and we can't have that happen here. And so it is, is wonderful to be able to have that conversation here in the Stonewalls uh, Center, um, but also during Pride Month. Um, and I think it's really, really important uh, that even outside of Pride Month, this conversation continues to ensure that we see equal and full protections under the law for all identities uh, wherever you are and choose to live and love and how you express yourself in any which way or form. So thank you all so much for being here. I'm excited that I was introduced by Helen, who also used to be on the board here at Stonewall. And so thank you so much for the service you continue to provide for our community. I have the wonderful opportunity of inviting MJ Hudson up uh, next. Um, and MJ is someone I have watched uh, for, for many years from afar and, and so thankful that you continue to serve our community in the wonderful ways that you have, being at least the first openly LGBTQ person here in Columbus in an elected office, um, which I think is something very, very important. So MJ, thank you. Uh, thank you for all you do, and, and I'm glad you're here with us today. Thank you so much, Denzel. Thank you. Good afternoon, and th Denzel, thank you so much. Thanks to Stonewall Columbus for uh, hosting us today, and uh, thanks to our panel. Um, I, uh, I am uh, MJ Hudson, and glad to be with you as moderator. I appreciate the Community Relations Commission inviting me. I am also a former uh, commissioner from, the, uh, uh, from uh, way back, so uh, gl really glad to see that we're, we're doing this today. Um, if, I, if the panel first, if we could turn to all of you, we've got a fantastic panel. Um, so I, I'd like to start here, and it, just if we could work down, if you could introduce yourself, have your name, uh, where you're from, and, and uh, um, what, your, what your work is with your organization. My name is Tracy Hairston. I work at Pathway Clubhouse um, under Concord Counseling Services, and we work with the mental health community. Um, my job is to have... Um, our members included and find jobs um, in the community. So I work with a lot of employers. Great. My name is Shereen Mehta. I'm a mental health consumer for 36 years. 
I'm part of Pathway Clubhouse, and I try to advocate as much as I can for mental health and for the pro Pathway program. Um, I'm Thomas Pope. Um, I'm a staff attorney at the Legal Aid Society of Columbus. Um, I work with a tenant advocacy project um, on fair housing and, and evictions, as well as a neighborhood stabilization project um, focused on the communities throughout Columbus. I'm Joseph Souza. I use he, him pronouns, and I do organizing and activism work with Equality Ohio uh, and focus a lot on the intersections of the experiences of LGBTQ Latinos specifically. My name is Cherise Sledge Thomas, and I currently work at the Columbus Chamber of Commerce, and I'm responsible for diversity, equity, inclusion, and access activities, policies, and all of those types of things um, within our organization, and also helping our member businesses enhance their, we call it DEIA, practices. Fantastic. Well, welcome uh, to everyone. And uh, today, as Helen mentioned, our theme is, is uh, uh, addressing public accommodation issues, understanding what that means and, and, uh, and what uh, your rights are as a, a member of the community with respect to uh, access to and use of public accommodation. Um, so I'm going to take a lay version. I am a lawyer, but it's, I'm, I don't practice in this area. But uh, the um, uh, public accommodation generally is there are many types of public spaces, um, public uh, areas, and public services. And all of that fits into the umbrella of public accommodation. Um, when uh, individuals who are members of a protected class, it's a legally recognized class of individuals who have been subject to discrimination historically, um, if they are denied access to public accommodation, there are rights under city, the city code, state law, and federal law at, at times to help protect and provide access to public accommodation. Those um, in the city of Columbus, the general uh, categories subject to that protected class are uh, ra based on race, uh, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, and disability. Um, I will ask our panel first, how did I do? Anything else you'd like to add to that really just very general introduction? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> great. Yeah. <laughs> so um, uh, at a basic level, and I'll open it up, um, what, does, uh, what does discrimination in a public accommodation, what does it look like from, the perspect from each of your perspectives? Um, Thomas, would you like to start us out? I'll start out with legal aid. What do you see in terms of cases involving public accommodation discrimination? Um, absolutely, yes. Yeah. So I think uh, in regard to public accommodations, they're typically public or public, like quasi-public spaces. And so because of that, they have a pretty large cross-section of, of people. Um, I think of uh, malls, uh, strip malls, shopping malls, things like that, um, but also like public buildings. And so because of that, um, you have a lot of people uh, sort of coming together and a variety of, of uh, interactions happen. If you're in a store, um, for instance, and you're, re you're, you're refused a kind of service or um, you're, giving a lower, you're given a lower quality service um, or you're simply not allowed in at all, um, that's a pretty common form of discrimination. Um, that's what we see across uh, gender identity, sexual orientation, race and ethnicity, um, and especially um, as well disability in terms of access to those places. Um, it's pretty common. Great. Tracy, um, what, what have you experienced or what are your clients experienced from, from Pathways in terms of public accommodation discrimination? Um, I would say just being accepted. Like when we walk in, um, sometimes they're um, identified as, you know, I've heard homeless or, you know, like, incompetent and you know they don't know us they, so I don't know I would say to accommodate us um, I would say accommodate a large group of people um, with disabilities or mental illness and don't just look at them like they can't participate because of certain uh, situations going on in their life so um, wheelchair wheelchair accessible um, places uh, we'd like to see more of that mm -hmm. and uh, what else anything else but it's also, it, it can go to a broad spectrum. I know, like, I have lots of scars from my life, the life I've lived, and sometimes I've gone into stores, and they take one look at you, and they're like, they walk away. 
I mean, the, my scars are visible. And it doesn't make you feel good. It makes you feel less than. And that happens a lot. And it's gotten better over the years, but it still happens. And that's the type of thing that people don't understand. Just because you may have, like I do, a mental illness, it doesn't mean that you're going to go out and attack somebody because you always hear the negativity. You don't hear the positive about people who have a mental illness. And that needs to change as well. Um, but it's just the feeling that you're not as good as everybody else when you are. You really are. Sure. Sure. Joseph? Yeah, I, I would add that I think um, the experience of discrimination probably uh, differs or there's a distinction between different protected classes. So I would, uh, I can speak specifically, uh, more specifically to the experiences of LGBTQ folks. When I think of places of, of public accommodation, places like stores that you shop in, the grocery stores, uh, where I get my hair done, um, you know, any place that is ex supposed to be accessible and available to the general public, um, a lot of times I hear, uh, I hear from folks in, in the community that um, maybe they've had an experience where they've been um, prevented from using the bathroom, right, in, in, a, in a public place, uh, or the bathroom uh, that aligns with how they identify, right? Or maybe denied uh, access to the dressing rooms in a store. Um, so actually like denied service, you know, it's like one end of the spectrum. And then sometimes it can be, um, softer, if I could put it that way, like and having to do a little bit more with like treatment or the vibe of how they're being being received or served. Like I think of, uh, I've heard from folks who um, feel, you know, going to a restaurant, they're always seated in the like least desirable, right? Like seating or corner of the restaurant might be like an, an ex just a few examples of some of the types of, of experiences that, uh, that individuals have, especially LGBTQ folks. Right, and and Charisse, from from, uh, from your perspective with the chamber or other, sure. and I think I'm also representing um, people who have been racialized as black or African American, and one of the things that I see is um, it's more subtle these days. So, um, for instance, dress code. So I always say. I, I'm, I show up corporate, golf, tennis, so I typically don't face some of those challenges. However, I do have um, children who present with darker skin than I do. And so I get to see the different treatment between even um, the same racialized category and how we're treated differently. So um, my older son, for instance, he likes to dress kind of hip hop like, right? So I've, we've been at the same place together. I'll walk in, fine, nothing happens. Um, he tries to come and meet me and there's, well, hi, can we help you? Um, who are you here to see? And I have watched like maybe 10 other people come in with none of those type of interactions, but when he comes to the door, that happens a lot. Um, I also see in, in the subtlety, at restaurants if there are large parties of um, people of color. And I will say sometimes there's a stereotype or truth that um, we can be boisterous, maybe a little loud. So it's the seating situation where folks will get seated further back in a restaurant or maybe not at all or maybe they're waiting and they don't know why they're waiting for so long. Um, and last but certainly not least, pricing. And this is one that I don't think a lot of people think about. So um, in many discriminatory situations, people will just price you out of it because they don't want to be accused of being racist or discriminatory. So they just will have more higher prices and a little more upscale, if you will. And that automatically will deter people who they perceive as not being able to afford their services. So uh, when someone dis someone uh, you've just you've all described really common and, and unfortunately very uh, frequent situations. So um, if if uh, many times if folks will go to the man we want to see the manager or there's a complaint um, to community organization they'll say well we have a neutral policy we treat everyone the same here um, and. Uh, Sometimes that uh, neutral policy may not be enforced uniformly or neutrally. Um, 
As, and uh, um, Sharice, just to go back to you to start maybe, but you know, in working with a business or talking with someone in a business, um, uh, it, for those viewers who might be working or have a business, how, is, how can employers work to you know, um, make sure that they're, the folks that are working for them are minding a neutral policy and not letting their personal views um, slip through or really you know, be detrimental to the customers? That's a good question. So when I work with employers, we talk about, even though we talk about diversity and inclusion and all those things, I also talk about performance management. And what I find is a lot of organizations may not have a solid performance management system where they're being clear about what it looks like to be successful and what it looks like to live out the values and the policies that we have in place as an organization. So one of the things that I help people understand is, hey, it's not just orientation and a handbook and a statement. When people do what you want them to do, they need to be recognized and rewarded, and you know that, that builds the, oh, this is how I'm supposed to treat people. This is what it looks like here. And when they don't do what they're supposed to do, they should be held accountable according to the performance management system that many don't have in place. So that's one thing that we do. We help them build out their performance management system and figure out how to make that real. Very good. Joseph, do you have thoughts on there? Yeah, I think the one thing I want to say about um, this topic in particular is that even though institutions can implement like a neutral policy, using that term, mm -hmm. in real practice and day-to-day -day life, there really is no such thing as neutrality. Mm -hmm. And I think we all need to really understand that um, at, a, at a sort of a cultural level, right? Mm -hmm. um, this is where it becomes really important, I think, for, uh, for people to understand implicit bias and um, the ways in which, you know, all of us have been conditioned to some degree, right? Grow, uh, conditioned in um, like a culture of white supremacy, a culture of, um, you know, valuing um, certain like conforming expressions of gender as opposed to so-called non-conforming expressions of gender, right? Though just as a few examples, um, and so, I think the key here for for businesses, for um, for anyone that uh, is that is a facilitator of a public accommodation, um, or is someone who's providing service, is to just be introspective and realize that we all walk with implicit bias day to day, and it's just being aware of that that's going to um, kind of be the best interpersonal tool you know that a person can use to to sort of question yourself and ask, okay, am I, um, uh, let, let's say to the, your example, Sharice, of let's say there is customers that are loud in the restaurant, right? And, um, it, you know, it, stopping yourself and asking, is my reaction and my annoyance to the noise mm -hmm. really neutral or is it amplified by the, those, the bias that I have right. in, inside me, of, you know, because of how these people look or how I perceive them or how they're presenting. Um, so I think that this is where it gets muddy because, um, you know, we're here to talk about the, um, the, the policy that we have on, on paper, right? Mm -hmm. Like the rights that we put on paper. Um, but one of the frameworks at e Equality Ohio, at least, that we try to use when we think about equality is that there is legal equality, but there's also lived equality. Mm -hmm. And- It's a great distinction. Right, we have to kind of understand that distinction and understand that they work together and be thinking about both uh, mm -hmm. when in actual day-to-day -day practice, we're trying to bring about and implement equality. Very good. Yes. Um, I have a metropolitan housing voucher, you know, subsidized housing, and that's a big problem. I know and it always has been, and I don't know if it'll change. Um, <clears throat> it's gotten a really bad reputation that somebody who has a housing voucher is going to destroy the apartment, make it dirty, nasty. That's not the case, but yet you have so many places to live which will put the, li deliberately put the rent $3 too high just so they don't have to accept those. And that's wrong. <laughs> but, I mean, there's a lot of people who have these who don't have a problem keeping their place. It's, and not all people who have a voucher are disabled. You know, they're in it. so there's no reason to have that much 
against somebody. So. Sure, sure. So um, for Shari uh, or, um, for Tracy or, or Thomas, uh, you probably do work with employer training and, um, and, and work. Any other thoughts on uh, how, to help them, how to help folks understand in the workplace how to, to get past implicit bias and, and uh, treat everyone fairly and their, take it off paper and make it lived? I love that. Just sort of one thought. Um, Please. One, one of the things we, we do is neighborhood stabilization is sort of help nonprofit and small business development as well. Um, but I yes. think um, in regard to just like both looking at the policies themselves um, and how they're implemented is also accepting feedback um, from a customer that says or a person, a patient that says, I was discriminated against in this way um, and taking a look at the policy itself. Um, mm -hmm. Is this neutral policy, does it function in any way that's necessary. Um, why are we banning a certain like headgear overall? Um, we, there may be a, a religious um, or, or gender discrimination in that way. Um, why are we having certain things that may discriminate against those with disabilities? So being flexible in regard to that policy and perhaps rethinking or retooling it entirely because it doesn't have a function um, that produces anything but discrimination. Um, I think it's really important to just actually sit back and take a look at it and decide, do we need this policy at all? Um, do we need to have sort of this security, for instance, if it, if it specifically harasses certain people, yes. um, perhaps we should just shift that entirely. Sure. And Tracy, your thoughts and uh, for how do employers can help those with, you know, employees or customers with, with mental health related issues make their, their businesses, their space welcoming? Um, I have came across like um, a lot of employers will say, you know, we'll treat them the same or some of them just don't want to do it anyway because they're thinking, oh, they're on medication, or what if they're not? I've got those questions like, yes. you know, what am I going to get if they're not well? Um, but a lot of the individuals I place have really outworked everybody. <laughs> I mean, they're hard workers, they're dedicated, they stay on their jobs a long time. Um, and I mean, th they have skills, um, they're, they're educated, they're, they have degrees. So we have to push that a little harder because once we go in there and tell them where we're from, they're like, a lot of them don't want to do it. They want to walk away or not hire them. So we're, we advocate like wholeheartedly um, so they can get that position. And we also be like, give us a chance, give us a, give us a shot and you, you know, you'll see. So we have, we work with a lot of people that come to us because they're like, oh, we love so-and-so, so give us somebody else. So, and that's what we, we want to go for mm -hmm. instead of saying, no, I won't work with them. So. Great, great. Well, uh, in the spirit of we are in Pride Month and here at the Stonewall Community Center, which is near and dear to my heart. Um, so, um, uh, uh, Joseph, if I, if I can start with you, um, what should the community know about the LGBTQI uh, plus community uh, and how they're perceived in, the, in, in public spaces? Um, and how, why is that important to, to discuss more than ever during Pride Month? Yes. And it's a big question, but. Yes, it, it is. I could, I could <laughs> take up all of our time on that question alone, which I'll try not to. <laughs> um, one, so I want to make a distinction. Mm -hmm. um, again, I, I talked before about the legal versus lived, uh, uh, you know, framework. Um, in, um, in, in the policy, right, in the city of Columbus, the protections that we have um, what, what is specifically protected as a protected class is what we would call um, SOGI, which uh, stands for sexual orientation, uh, gender identity, and gender expression. Um, and that is actually what is named as, prote as protected and not necessarily um, LGBTQ, right? Yes. And there's a reason for that. And that is that um, sometimes um, the way that people are perceived has a lot more to do with whether or not they experience discrimi discrimination. Sometimes that is more of a factor than a person's actual identity. Mm -hmm. It has happened before, it does happen, that people who are not LGBTQ experience LGBTQ discrimination, mm -hmm. which has a lot to do with the fact that, let's say you have a person who is straight and cisgender, but maybe the way that they dress or the way that they present themselves, or I don't know, just something, right? Um, that you're in a place of public accommodation and you are perceived um, to have an identity that you actually is not your identity, or maybe maybe you know. I always call it I get served. 
all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That kind of a that kind of a yeah. I, I'm, yeah. So someone sees I have short hair. I might be in jeans and a t-shirt or something. But they, you know, it's not that they don't look at at us as human beings. And so correct. And then and then you know if it continues or I correct them, then they get a little mm -hmm. ruffled and out of sorts. Like and it wasn't my. It's you are doing it to me. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah, I think that's an excellent example. And why that's important, well, there's a lot of reasons I think that's important to think about and consider, is that um, in that way, when you think about that, LGBTQ equity actually, it really matters for everyone, <laughs> even folks that are not a part of this community. Like, anyone and everyone can actually be impacted by a culture that devalues LGBTQ folks or that devalues um, non-binary gender expression, for example. Um, you know, I know, speaking for myself, my own personal experiences, I am uh, gay, I am an LGBTQ person, um, but I've noticed that what has actually mattered more in my own personal life experience is, um, not even if people know how I identify. I actually was closeted for many, many years and, and was saying that I was straight, right, all these years. And still, during that period, definitely experienced um, different treatment and sometimes discrimination. Mm -hmm. um, and when I think about that, I'm like, it's not because people even knew or even cared what my identity was. It's because of the way I was perceived, you mm -hmm. know, maybe the energy that I carry in a, in a room was just a little too feminine, right, for, for them. And that's why at this point, I even, I make it a point actually now, I just be myself, I wear these earrings, I, I make it a point to do that because I have nothing to lose, right? right. Um, and I think that's just an important thing to, to think about specific to LGBTQ equity and why, um, why, the ec equity for this community, it's not even just this community. It really, um, if, if LGBTQ people really, really have equity and it lived equity, um, probably most everyone else does too. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Um, so um, for, uh, for Cherise, um, what are some of the historic ways in which uh, the black community has been treated in, uh, differently in, in um, public places and the modern day implications? And, and for me, I'm also think just a couple of weeks ago, I was in Memphis and uh, went to the National Civil Rights Museum and saw the, you know, the, the lunch counters that were preserved. And, and that, that's what really strikes me for historic. But uh, I, I know we're a long way from that and sometimes not so far away. Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, obviously, we know what happened in the South. If you, you know, were enslaved, you had to be accompanied by someone or you needed a pass, right? Mm -hmm. And even though the North would say that they were different, there were still a little some suspect things going on then, too. Then we all know we transitioned to Jim Crow, which was a separate but equal or perceived equal. And there was the, okay, you stay over there, you stay over there, and you know you do your thing, we do ours, and your own public accommodations. And that even led to um, those who are, once again, racialized back then as Negro. Um, there was a book that was called the Negro Motorist Green Book. And that was something that you had in your car if you were traveling. Um, my parents talk about it because you had to know where it was safe to go to the bathroom or to stop or you know which lunch counter you could go to or did you have to walk around back or whatever the rules were. Um, then of course that all kind of sort of went away or at least legally went away, maybe not lived. Um, and then we started experiencing things like redlining where it, even though we're no longer separate but equal, we're supposed to be able to all live together and be happily ever after, um, that didn't quite happen. Neighborhoods, especially here in Ohio, were redlined, right? And that was another way to say, hey, you stay over there, we stay over here, you all stay over there, and we're all... And, and my understanding in Columbus, I just saw a presentation mm -hmm. on this about a month ago, the, there's some there are some folks at Ohio State that have done some great research yes. on this. The neighborhood I mean, it was done through the realtors and mm -hmm. and not just through, 
you know, deed restrictions, but the the realtor community and the business, you know, folks in businesses, they've made very clear lines of distinction on where you could live depending on your race. Definitely. And I would suggest that even today that, once again, it's the subtleties. Um, some of that still happens, but it's very hard to prove these days, right? Um, so when you transitioning from that was the past, this is today, mm -hmm. once again, it's all about mindsets, and some of those mindsets have not changed. But people know it's not popular, it's not the right thing, or they, once I go back to not wanting to be labeled as racist, discriminatory, prejudiced. So it's more of everything that we described in, with your first question. You know, dress mm -hmm. codes, you don't look like you belong. Um, my the children in my family have these skits that they do about they call they 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 call it Karens, um, people who are kind of like why are you here do we know you, um, mm -hmm. it's it's very subtle but it's it's still there, and it like I said it's everything that we all described. Absolutely, um, so uh, uh, for Tracy. Um, I know you've provided some great examples, um, but uh, um, uh, I, and I, but I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, how, what, what do you think historically? How have you seen things change for for folks working with pathways, and and uh, where do you see glimmers of hope out there? I see hope um, definitely with the mental health, mm -hmm. more housing opportunities. Um, more inclusion um, with jobs and public places. Um, I still see a little bit of discrimination though, still. Um, mm -hmm. And not just with mental health, but um, racially as well. It's um, housing, again, like, you know, it's, it's some unfairness. They're treated different when even they're doing an the application. Um, I also see in restaurants, seating, seating you in the back again, seating you. Um, another example was, uh, being out one time and it was tense on the patio, but it was cold. Well, yeah. they were trying to push my group that way to, to the cold tents. I mean, we sat out there because they're like, you don't want to wait an hour. This is where you got to sit. So it's like, <laughs> you know. The unheated tents. Yes, the unheated oh, tents. It's cold. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it's gotten better, but you do still see it. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen where we're going to place like a doctor's office or something and, um, who I brought is overlooked. They're waiting. They're waiting for hours. You have to call a manager. Like we've been sitting out here too. Yes. Um, and don't get called yeah. on as fast. Mm -hmm. um, and I've heard that through some members, even like yesterday, um, they were treated poorly at a hospital uh, when they went in. Oh, mm -hmm. they said they'll look at your record and all of a sudden, you know, you're not important. So mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. Like mm -hmm. what you, if you go to a hospital, what's wrong you're still not believed or they because they can have access to your records and you're just mm -hmm. treated completely different and it's like i'm human i have this going on and you're not treated right right so yes and now we add in ohio the conscience clause um which you know troubles me as i get older you know who's gonna say well you're a lesbian so i don't have to treat you mm -hmm. um so um so we talk about some of this thomas in terms of living it how, what are what's recourse? What recourse is out there from our, our representative from Legal Aid? Um, uh, I'm sure you're sitting here hearing these cases. What uh, what recourse do folks in the community have um, to to address um, discrimination in public accommodation? Um, absolutely, yes. Yeah. So. I guess there's there's a few sort of like different oh, and, different and you know folks here it's you know you don't have to rush to court to do everything there's a lot of other things that they could do so. right right well I was in thinking about sort of the legal action so I guess there's yes. there's the there's the interpersonal action in terms of um, reporting it or or talking to this, the city itself I know allows for reports um, of discriminatory discriminatory acts in in public accommodations um, specifically when I look at sort of I do fair housing so in that yes. way um, we do fair housing claims. Um, and so there is actively uh, discrimination um, for gender identity, um, for sexual orientation, or perceived sexual orientation, perceived gender identity, um, in race, um, naturally in class, of course. And I think in, in noting all of these, there's always, always an intersection in, in how they're handled. Um, 
and you, you find that like it gets more and more highly concentrated in those areas. And so um, the Ohio Civil Rights Commission as well um, mm -hmm. takes on um, these cases when there is discrimination. You can sort of show it. Um, like this happened. Um, it was because of this. Like this is their, their perceived um, basis. Their, their perceived bias in in bringing about this discrimination against me. Um, and it happened in this period of time, um, something like six months, within the six month period. Um, you can then give it to, send it to them, um, report it to them, and they'll investigate it um, and take that on. Um, we take on fair housing as a sort of a separate, but that's sort of what we do in the same way. Mm -hmm. You feel that this is clearly discriminatory or um, a lot of the time, and I think it's important, I think when we look back at um, both the history of um, bias against LGBTQIA people, then the, the histories of bias against black people and people of color, in these areas, um, there's a chilling effect. And so I think in looking at discrimination, discrimination, you have to look at a chilling effect, um, a feeling of I'm not welcome here, so I won't even be there. Like discrimination doesn't even have to happen. I just know it's going to happen, so I will not be present in this public accommodation or in this, this housing community of a certain kind. And so I think that's a bit harder to um, fight back against because now it's the belief that this will happen as opposed to this actually happening. Even if it's a pretty long history of it happening. Um, but I think um, in regard to the recourse, you have, there are legal options. Um, there are also public options in terms of just, um, you can find finding a representative or a person, whether a legal representative or not, and um, sort of, telling that story um, and seeing where it can go, um, whether a legal way or, or a media way or sort of a general public response to it. Um, you have those as options available, but Great. I'm naturally biased towards the, the legal end because um, it's, it's what I do, but yeah. That's why I started with you, that I knew. I, I don't mean to do the Socratic method, but I'm, I'm doing that, so. Um, other, other folks, yes. If I could just, I also want to just say to anyone watching, um, anyone that thinks, ooh, did I experience discrimination or whatever, I do want to encourage you to actually to file a complaint and to take action. I know, um, so speaking to the chilling effect, I think there's also, like, there's a lot of intersecting effects that discrimination has. And for folks with the most at stake, I would say especially folks with intersecting identities, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, black and Hispanic LGBTQ people with disabilities, right? Like, yes. you know, people yes. with all these intersections, especially who are going to be more vulnerable to experience um, discrimination and not even be able to place, you know, all the time, why am I being discriminated against or what's, what was the factor, right, right of right. that. Um, I think sometimes there's also this, like, fatigue that is experienced where let me just, especially with public accommodations, let me just, let me just not, let me just move on, not file a complaint. Um, I know there were two previous sessions about employment and housing discrimination, and sometimes when I think about those areas, I would imagine that there's more of a push to take action because it's literally where you work. You got to deal with it all the time, right? Or it's where you live or are trying to live. Whereas public accommodation, speaking to that chilling effect, I could sort of just decide I'll never step foot in this restaurant again yeah. um, or this place of business yeah. What again. if it's the only grocery store in your, in your neighborhood? Right. Or it's the only mall or the only shopping center where you can get to from your right. home. But also making the complaint is yeah. ultimately going to be a part of what brings about cultural change, like in the mm -hmm. long run, right, in the long term. If we're not holding folks accountable, they never learn. Mm -hmm. And I would invite us to not even necessarily look at, uh, you know, the, the complaint process for discrimination as much as uh, you did you did wrong to me, so I'm going to get revenge and get you. Like, maybe, you know, I would invite us to maybe not even think of it so much as that and instead um, approach it as um, let me invite this place of public accommodation to do some learning, right? And, mm -hmm. and to, you know, maybe, maybe give them the opportunity. Maybe they um, want to, you know, uh, correct their actions, right? Maybe a, maybe a business can't speak for everyone, but... Um, but we can't bring about the change unless we make the noise that we need to make, right? Unless we make the complaints. And even though there's fatigue experienced after being, I, I know that feeling, um, I do encourage folks to, to file complaints and to, to take some, to some type of recourse that's available. No, it's uh, great, great. And, and it does take someone to stand up and step out sometimes uh, to, to, make, to make that change in the community. 
Um, you know, often I know through the years I would hear um, whether it's about disability or, um, or training or other things from you hear from the employer community. Oh, th this is just adding expense to my business. I don't have time for this. I, you know, why do I have to? Why do I have to accommodate? Why? Why a reasonable accommodation? Like this is unreasonable. Some people are just resistant to change period like just let me do what I want to do when I want to do it um, I'm wondering for for the panel uh, examples of you know where you've worked with a business or you know knowing of reasonable accommodation what does that look like what does that look like so uh, to Joseph's point someone makes that comment makes that complaint put something in um, what's that look like next and how can how can um, uh, other supporters in the community maybe speak to that business talk to those folks and say it's okay um, I don't know Sharice what do you think so one of the things that we do at the chamber and I keep saying we and um, I have to introduce my partner in magic who's not here right now her name is Kelly Fuller she's our VP of workforce and talent amazing Great. Um, we Great keep team. a list of, I'll say, resources and agencies. So if someone says, I am having trouble figuring out how to accommodate folks with disabilities, we have a place that we can send them. If someone says, hey, I have um, some new employees, they're, you know, identifying as LGBTQ plus or, you know, we don't know what to do. So I know where to refer them. And we, we send, I mean, we have some basic information we can share with them, but we like to refer them to who we consider to be the experts in that space. Um, and there, for some other things, like when people run into, well, I don't want to hire this group of people or because of this reason, a lot of times there are um, government funds available to help with certain things. I'm not talking about discrimination, but like, maybe training or yeah training resources. or different resources there's so many things out there to help employers mm -hmm. um, make accommodations of all kinds so that's what we do at the chamber we make sure that we we always say we connect convene and consult so as we're consulting and we're hearing what your needs are we're like, oh, well, let's connect you with Equality Ohio, or let's connect you with Stonewall, or this group, or that group, mm -hmm. Greenleaf, or whomever, or Pathways. So that's how we do it. We send them to the experts, or if there's a financial issue of some sort, or a training issue, we send them to the right agency. That's great. And I want to just take a second. Hold on. Uh, for folks watching, we're going to have an opportunity for questions in just a minute here. So if you have a question, post it on the Facebook page. Uh, we have someone monitoring. Pedro is going to let us know, and we'll try to respond to those questions as well. So other uh, examples of reasonable accommodation or accommodation or working with employers to, to get over this uh, concern. Um, Tracy and Shireen, have you, I'm sure you've worked with that in Pathways. How have you helped employers navigate that, that uh, area? Um, we offer, and I'm one of the people that will go and they'll let us come and work with them side by side. Mm -hmm. They'll let us go through the orientation with them. Um, yeah. They'll let us uh, actually do their job <laughs> um, as supportive employment. Um, we get in there, we do their job until they're comfortable. Yeah. Um, and then we step away slowly. So we do have great employers that do that. Um, and that always is a plus. Um, if something goes wrong and say someone's having a bad day or a bad week and they have to you know, leave or they walk off, um, we still work with the employer too accommodate them as far as um, let, let me work with them and we'll get them back together. We'll get them back in here and this is why. So we definitely have to have a relationship uh, when we're out with employers and um, building jobs. We have to create that relationship and let them know what they're going through. Mm -hmm. So it, it seems to work pretty well. Terrific. Mm -hmm. Well, Pathway is just an inclusive place altogether. Yeah. It doesn't matter what part of the community you're in how you identify, you're just accepted for who you are at completely. I have been no place else like it. I don't, except other clubhouses. And it's a good feeling, knowing that that's, that's one great. place I can always go where I'm accepted for me. 
our first question uh, is, is it okay to let a business know that I think I'm being treated differently and why? Um, we've talked about this just a little bit, but um, let's elaborate on this. Yeah, I think it always is good to. Um, now, there's there's a comfort level with it um, mm -hmm. in, in regard to who you're talking to. Are, are you talking to sort of somebody who's at sort of a, a lower level in the organization that doesn't have much, much say, or are you comfortable even talking and bringing up these discriminatory issues themselves? Um, but I think it's important, if you do feel comfortable to say something, absolutely say something. Um, if you'd like to talk to somebody else about it and have them as, as well sort of bring support for it, um, do that. Um, I think there, there are like, there's supportive organizations out there, but if you're an individual and you're like, this is something that I have seen or I have experienced, um, and you feel comfortable saying it, absolutely, um, do say it. So, and I'll just put in a plug, I know for Department of Neighborhoods Community Relations Commission, um, that's a safe place to, to air your concern. So if you're not sure, that's certainly one safe place where if you don't have to go directly to the business, but you can go to someone who can help you work through the issue and help work with those folk, with the, the business independently of you being involved. So, um, other, other folks, Shereen. One thing that stands out to me as well is I, I think a lot of business owners want to know. They want to know how people are experiencing their accommodations. And so I think it's important to share. What I encourage people to do is to be clear, um, provide examples, and then provide what it should have looked like. Mm -hmm. So this is what happened, you know, and what I would have liked to have seen is this. Yes. Because sometimes it's an educational opportunity. We live in a cancel culture where we'll just say, oh, I'm not going there anymore. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that doesn't solve the problem. It helps when people know what the wrong was, how it could be right. And if we can acknowledge our emotions, work through them, and approach the person or the business owner without harming them, it's important not to inflict the same harm that you received. That's a gr absolutely great advice. So, Joseph, other thoughts from for you? Yeah, I just I amplify that, and again reiterate this invitation to think of it as educating and and. I guess playing a role in the larger cultural change and less of a, I'm gonna get them, I'm gonna get this business. Because I know that also um, in public accommodation specifically, um, uh, for me, sometimes the, sometimes the discriminator actor has been um, like a service worker. And I also right, have an awareness and like a conscious for, um, for, for ser you know, service workers or some, some really, really exploited, right, in the, in the American workforce. We, <laughs> I just am aware of that. And I also have a tendency like, oh, you know, I don't want to get, you know, my waiter or waitress in trouble or, you know, for example, right, right? because I also uh, am aware that there's an issue there. And I think sometimes some of us, especially in these communities when we're hyper aware of social inequities, there's such a difficult balancing act with, well, maybe it's not worth me making, may, let me not be that Karen, right, is a, is a, is a thing um, that's experienced. But that's why I would amplify what, um, what Sharice is sharing about, like, it, yes. it's, a, it's an educational opportunity. So our, our second question, um, and I think we've addressed some of this, but I, I just want to make sure we go right to this question because it's a good one. Um, what if I'm not 100% sure why I'm being treated differently, uh, but I'm guessing it's because of my race? Should I still file a complaint? Uh, Joseph touched on this in the intersection, uh, the issue of intersection uh, earlier. I know there are times when it's easier for me. I feel like uh, it being a woman is tougher than being an out lesbian um, so uh, not not to the point but I just keep marching forward so but um, uh, should if someone's not sure why but they don't feel comfortable what do you think her folks to talk to management mm -hmm. talk to management first um, get a dialogue going and ask questions um, you've got to ask questions because maybe it wasn't that maybe it was something you did um, the reason why you know you're being confronted or feel like that. Now, after that, then yeah, I think a complaint should be filed. Mm -hmm. But speak up for yourself, ask questions, and get to the bottom line. Yeah. For other folks? 
Yes. Okay. I agree. Conversation is key. Mm -hmm. yeah. You don't uh, say anything, nothing's going to ever change. Right. 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 Absolutely. And I think for a lot of us with, with, um, marginalized identities, I don't like to use that term, but for lack of a better term in this moment, um, uh, a lot of us, like, different treatment is our normal, mm -hmm. you know? So it becomes really difficult to even identify, right? Like, mm -hmm. oh, you know, I mean, we're, we're so inexperienced sometimes with realizing what normal should be, right? And mm -hmm. so there's this drug, there is that self That's a self really great point, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's like, it, you, sometimes it's like, wow, that was actually even more relaxing than usual. So, <laughs> that didn't, that really didn't, that wasn't in, uncomfortable this time. Wow, that's great. Um, uh, well, I, oh, we've got more, okay. Okay. Um, oh, the, this, uh, so, so, Therese, I think this is, I have you start here, but what can we do to stop clubs and bars from having racist dress policies? Uh, is this public accommodation discrimination? Um, for the latter question, I'm just going to say, in my view, absolutely yes. Yeah. And it's hard, too, because um, as, you know, a business owner, you may want a certain atmosphere that has nothing to do with how people are racialized or how they identify or what have you. You just might say, hey, I want an upscale restaurant and I want this, I want that. Those aren't the um, public places that I'm about to refer to. Oh. Mm -hmm. It's more of, um, I, I, when I was younger, I used to be up and down the street just like everyone else. Sure, and sure. and you, you'll go in and you see people dressed a certain way, and but you're seeing people at the door getting turned away for being dressed the same way. Yes. Um, so I think... You, it's safe to say no shoes, no shirt, no service. I, I get that. It's not safe to... Hoodies aren't about hygiene. Yes, hoodies or, you know, turbans or... Um, Hijab. Even just hair. Mm -hmm. Like, it, especially, and I'll... Mostly black and Latino women in this example, but, you know, a lot of us tend to have big hair. And there's a perception that you could be hiding weapons in your hair and all, all those types. It, it gets Holy crazy, cow. I'm telling you. So I do think that the, there are no shoes, no shirt. I get that. But it's when you start nitpicking and you're picking things that are associated with certain, the word I hate too, marginalized groups because you don't want so many in your place of business. And once again, it's a conversation. If we don't have those conversations with business owners who are doing those types of things, Though some of them may not even be thinking about it. Mm -hmm. You know, who knows? Their mentor might have told them to set their business up that way. Yeah. So it, it's about the conversation. And then if there's no result, then we take the other action that's mentioned. So our, our final question, and I want to make sure we've got time for everybody to just say a little clo quick closing comment. But uh, about, uh, the last question was, how do we support a friend or family member who may be treated differently? And I, and I just want to stick with, you know, like the dress code example. But we may observe. We may observe behavior. And it's not directed at us, but it's directed at someone either we know or maybe someone who's there and we don't know. But uh, I think about places I've gone and you see the dress code uh, um, posted at the door. And you know that's not right. Um, I mean, you could certainly confront folks as you go in, but also, boy, taking a picture of that and getting it, to, if you get it to the CRC, if you get it over to the chamber, there are, I know I serve on the Short North Alliance board here. There are a lot of organizations and community groups that'll help go to that business and say, this is why this is not okay. Um, but uh, uh, other thoughts on how you can help a friend who might have had uh, had an issue? One thing that I would say, and I'm guilty of this too, um, we try to explain away, are, are you sure? Well, maybe they were just full, or maybe they just had a bad day, or, yeah. or it wasn't that bad, you'll be fine. I would say we have to cease and desist immediately with that type of response. Mm -hmm. I feel like the first thing you do is listen, and then from there, I always ask, are you venting or do you want a solution? 
And if they want a solution, then the things we talked about here today, yes. conversation, conversation doesn't work, you know, then there's a complaint and all, and all of those things. But it, I am adamant about let's stop telling people how they should feel or what we believe they experienced. Absolutely. So we just we just have a couple minutes left. I think if you could, and I apologize, I look at my I should have, but if I put it up here, then it goes blank. Mm -hmm. Probably haven't said it right. Maybe if we could just start uh, here with Tracy. Just go down and remind everybody. If somebody tuned in late, remind them of your name, the organization you're with, and um, just a you know little couple couple sentence closing remark. Okay, my name is Tracy Harrison. Again, I work at Pathway Clubhouse under Concord Counseling Services as the Employment and Inclusion Specialist. Um, closing remarks, I say just treat people with respect, understand their differences, um, let them know they matter. That was well put. <laughs> I like thank that. And I also want to thank Shereen who made these beautiful pins for all of us. Yes. Thank, you. thank you so much. Uh, do you, if you want to introduce and just a little, one little closing remark. Um, I'm Shereen Mehta. I go to Pathway Clubhouse through Concord Counseling. I'm um, a longtime mental health consumer. Everybody is a person. Everyone to treat, deserves to be treated the same. I wish everybody could do that. Um, and it's come a long way. Uh, just, I feel proud to be able to be here. And it just shows how how far things are coming. And we thank you for being here today. Thank you, Thomas. Oh, um, Thomas Pope um, again with the Legal Aid Society of Columbus. Um, I guess in regard to sort of closing remarks, just um, because you know it is Pride Month, it, you, it's a reminder you do have the right to dress and present yourself in a manner consistent with your gender identity, to be free from harassment, and the right to and you do have the right to not be refused entry participation in any kind of service because of any of those perceptions of your sexuality, gender, or gender identity. Thank you. Joseph? Um, I'm Joseph Souza. I use he, him pronouns, and I do organizing and activism work for Equality Ohio. And actually, for my closing statement, I'd like to do a call to action. Um, here in the city of Columbus, we have established uh, discrimination protections that are inclusive of LGBTQ folks by including sexual orientation and gender identity and expression as protected classes. Um, unfortunately, that is not the case at the state level of government, mm -hmm. um, which um, is a big part of the work that we do at Equality Ohio actually, is advocating for the Ohio Fairness Act, which is the bill at the state level. There's a House and a Senate version, mm -hmm. uh, and it would codify uh, official protections on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity and expression. And we're one of how many states that don't have this protection? You know what? I don't have the state we're, number there off aren't the top men. of my head. We are down at the bottom of we're, the list. We're down at the bottom. Yes. Um, and what that, what that does is it leaves a lot of the state vulnerable. And a lot of cities, like Columbus, um, have taken it upon themselves to protect local, implement, you know, local protections. Um, but they only exist in, 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 in Columbus, right? Like, there's other cities. There's, I think, uh, just over 30 mm -hmm. um, throughout the state. Um, more than 30 that have that have implemented protections, but that leaves this sort of patchwork of of if you're an LGBTQ person, you're protected here, but if you drive outside of the city, you're not. You know what? I mean? You could down all on Tangy River Road, and you're doing fine till you get to Lenox, <laughs> yeah. and suddenly that's Clinton Township, and you're not in Columbus anymore. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's uh, so it does leave us vulnerable. So my call to action: one, to be aware of this effort to pass the Ohio Fairness Act at the state level government, and I would encourage anyone watching um, to reach out to your legislators and ask them to support the Ohio Fairness Act. Yes. And if you need assistance doing so, you can visit uh, equalityohio.org. We have um, more information on the website. Fantastic. And, and Shereen. Awesome. And last but certainly not least, I, one of the things I want to say is that business owners are humans too. And sometimes they or their employees may make mistakes. And I want to reiterate, um, conversations are educational opportunities. And let's stop the cancel culture. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Well, we, I, thank you so much. I thank the Community Relations Commission for uh, asking me to join this incredible panel. And to all the panel here, thank you so much for your time and wisdom, sharing your experiences and wisdom today. We really, really appreciate it. So um, thanks to all who are watching, and, and uh, we, we hope to see you again on, on one of the next CRC programs.